I am Daniel Lucas, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He is the author of several books, you know, other than Mr. Anthony Keller. Thank you, Daniel. Great to be back. Yes, Mr. Andy. Welcome back. And as usual, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. I am a real estate investor and have been invested in properties for about 33 years. And I believe we're going to talk about a book I wrote that discussed our investment strategy. Yes, sounds interesting, but before we do that, let's do the recap of the book that we talked about our last episode, Taking the High Road, Divorce with Compassion. Sure. So, um, Daniel and everybody, I am a successful real estate investor, but I wrote a different type of book recently that just got launched called Take the High Road, Divorce with Compassion for Yourself and Your Family. As I went through a challenge in divorce on my own, and I read a lot of other books to try to help me, and I noticed a gap in a divorce book space, and I felt I was qualified to fill that gap. So my two books are very different, Daniel. This last book is really out there to try to help people um, who are going through uh, what is arguably, for many, the most challenging part of their life. And land in a better place, both themselves and their children. Um, and my, this book we're going to talk about today is an investment book about making money. So uh, from there, two very different places, but this last book I wrote um, was kind of my, my give back for all the people who helped me. And I tried to fill this gap that existed in a divorce book space. And based on the early reviews, I'm pretty proud of what we've created. Definitely. So let's talk about buy low, rent smart, sell high. My first question is, is it worth it to rent or to buy your own house? Oh, I, I'm an absolute believer in, in buying uh, property as a primary residence and as an investment, da uh, Daniel. It's, um, it's, in my humble opinion, I'm very biased. It's the easiest way to acquire passive income. And for most uh, in North America, at least, and actually probably around the world, the primary resident is your largest investment. So if you do buy your own property as you start in life and you prepare to settle down, hopefully with a nice partner, and you slowly pay your mortgage off, by the time you don't want to work as much, You've got a nice asset paid for that will give you options. And that's why this is so important. Many people around the world, it's so difficult to save money and put money aside for retirement. And your primary residence is kind of one of the easiest retirement plans you could have because you've got to pay to have a roof over your head. And instead of renting, pay a mortgage which at some point will be a large asset for the homeowner. Very well said, Mr. Andy. So what is the difference between the commercial and residential real estate? Sure. Well, commercial real estate uh, can take many different forms, uh, Daniel. Commercial real estate is, I would define it as a property that has a, um, a business usage. So a warehouse, a strip mall, a, um, a skyscraper, uh, a hotel. These are examples of commercial properties. Uh, the, what goes on in that property, the goal is to make money, <laughs> whether it be like a hotel or a business that's operated there. A, re a residential property is uh, a property that is a primary residence. It's where uh, somebody lives, um, so those are your two differences. Now, an apartment building would be called a commercial property because for the landlord, it's an investment. It's not typically the landlord's primary residence. 
as most landlords don't live in the properties that they own, unless it might be something like a duplex. So uh, that's how I would separate these two types of properties, Daniel. Very well said, Mr. Andy. So what factors determine the market value of a property? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I define it very simply as what people are willing to pay at that very point in time. Uh, it seemed like an overly simple answer, Daniel, but let me explain. So we all know what happened in the Great Recession in 2008. The real estate market, the bubble burst. And in some parts of North America, the values fell by as much as 40 or 50 percent. But that same property a year earlier was selling for 40 or 50 percent more. It's simply what people are able or willing to pay at that point in time. That is the value of residential real estate. So the challenge people have in buying, whether it's a primary residence or buying an investment property, is you want to time your purchase. So ideally, you're not buying at that high point and you're buying at least at a stable point or a low point so that the likelihood is the property will go up in value, not go down in value. Wow, well said, Mr. Andy. So can you explain the concept of a mortgage and how it works? Sure. So properties, properties out there, everybody, let, let's, let's talk about a primary residence, a mortgage for a primary residence. So properties, let's say you're looking at a property, you're three years out of college, you've got a nice job, you got a partner, you guys are going to get married, so you got two incomes. Um, and the property in the subdivision where you want to buy and one day raise a family is selling for 400000 Well, if you're three or four years out of college, you probably don't have three or $400,000 in cash, but you've got seven, eight, nine, ten thousand. 10000 So what a mortgage is, is very simply, is an individual or a, um, a couple who go to a bank and say, you need three things to buy a property. You need to have some cash, you need to have stable employment, and you need to have reasonably good credit. So you take those three things and you go to a bank and say, okay, I'm going to give you, Mr. Banker, I'm going to give you our mortgage company, I'm going to give you $10,000. And will that allow me to get a mortgage to buy this property? And the bank says, okay, I'll take your 10,000. That's called the down payment. And we will finance the rest of the 390. And you're gonna pay us slowly over the next 15 or 30 years. The two most common mortgages in North America, the 30 year followed by the 15 year mortgage. And over that length of time, the remaining 390,000 plus interest is paid back to the bank. And if the homeowner actually stays in that property the entire 30 years and pays their mortgage and doesn't change, uh, refinance or move to a different city, at the end of the 30 years, they would own that property outright. But before we go on, I want to shout out to the people listening in Sweden. Thank you, Sweden, for supporting this podcast because in Stockholm County, I got 38%, Stockholm 19%, Jokumping of 14%, West Gotland County at 8%, Vasta Gotland at 5%, Uppsala at 5%, Dalama County at 3%, and many more. Thank you, Sweden, for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world. Like Mr. Andy Heller, spy low, red smart, sell high. How did you craft it? Ed? Well, it's a great story. Um, so I was single for many years and I didn't want to tell my friends about buying properties and investing. Um, I preferred to keep it kind of quiet. And um, so many of my close friends, Daniel, had no idea that I had a side business 
buying a lots of properties. I would just take care of this million on the weekends and after work. So it was a coffee. I moved to the Bay Area and I was having coffee with this guy. Uh, he was kind of a master networker. And I was talking about what by, about my investment strategy back east. And he said, you know, I've never heard of a strategy like that. That makes so much sense. You guys ought to write a book. And both my real estate partner and I were in a period of time in our careers where we had a bit of extra time. So I like, why not? That sounds like a pretty cool idea. I, I, I put an outline together and sent it to a, the leading publisher of real estate investment books. Heard back from the publisher and said, we love this. They interviewed us and asked us some questions and then signed us to a book contract. And the two of us had never written anything before. So what, so over the, over the next um, six months, we worked on this book and I can circle back on the process and explain because the process was kind of interesting how we wrote it. But the, the, the neat thing about this book is we were just a couple part-time real estate investors and about six months after it launched, I got a call from our publisher, Daniel, and he said, Andy, I got, a, a, I got an inquiry from Fortune magazine. They got hold of your book and they want to interview you and Scott. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, in, the, in North America, Fortune magazine is certainly one of the top, if not the top magazine that uh, examines the financial world and opportunities. So apparently they were doing some uh, uh, feature of different real estate strategies. They got hold of our book and said, this, seemed, this makes a lot of sense. So they interviewed my partner and I, and a couple months later, our book, a couple part-time real estate investors got featured in Fortune magazine among the top five resources for real estate investors. And from that, I started getting requests to speak and teach our strategy of investing around the country. And that actually led to a part-time business. So it was a great story. And this is all from a book that we wrote on a whim. Um, and uh, somehow it just caught, it caught sales and took off. Congratulations, Mr. Andy. So, buy low, rent smart, sell, sell high behind the title of your book. So the title of the book is what we call our real estate strategy. And there's actually, um, you know, I teach real estate around the country. I do five or six seminars a year, Daniel. And, you know, one of the things I would say is a lot of investors, they only focus on buy-in um, and they don't really think through what to do with the property after they bought it. Some investors, they only focus on renting and a problem is they didn't buy the property low enough for their rental strategy to make money. We believe passionately that there are three key pillars to being a successful investor, buy low, rent smart, and sell high. And that's what we had always called our strategy. So when it came time to write our book, what made sense is not only to use that title, our, our strategy as the title of the book, but it also conveys to the reader that it's not just about buying property. You've got to have a good strategy in place for what to do with the property after you bought it. It's not just about renting or selling because you got to be buying the property low enough for your rental strategy to make money. And there has to be a margin there for you to sell the property and make money. So the, the title of the book is what we call our investment strategy, buy low, rent smart, sell high. So what are the benefits and risks of investing in real estate? Ooh, well, we could be talking for the next hour, but I'll give you a summary. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the risks, and this is why I teach around the country, the risk is that you go in at the wrong time and or you have not effectively researched and flushed out a strategy. And when I teach around the country, I do meet students 
who buy a property here or there and they don't they haven't really they haven't really flushed through their strategy so the risk there if you're not detailed is you're going to make a mistake you're not going to make money and even you might lose money but the but if you do it the right way and this is why i i teach around the country daniel because i do believe it's the easiest way to acquire wealth uh is invested in real estate and i'm not i know you have a worldwide audience and i'm not sure what the statistics are like in sweden or and, and around um in other countries around the world but in North America, there's an amazing statistic, everybody. There are more millionaires created from real estate than from every other field of business combined. So clearly, this is a great way for people to build wealth. And to answer your question on the benefits is that if you, if you have flushed out a good strategy, Let's say you're one of my students. You've you've got, you've made some investment in educational material, so you've got a framework to follow. You're not trying to wing it. Well, if you follow a good strategy, you will have essentially a business plan for making money, and then all you have to do is execute on that strategy effectively, as opposed to the investor who's trying to wing it and figure out along the way. Uh, there is, and I don't have the statistics behind this, Daniel, but there is a correlation between investors who invest in education, like reading my book is a great first step, but for, for real estate investors, you've got to go further. You've got to get software that investors use. You've got to have a detailed, detailed business plan. And the benefits are, in my humble opinion, and I'm completely biased, it is the easiest way to acquire wealth around the world. And the reason why I think it's so easy and the reason why so many people do it, uh, you asked me a really interesting question in the beginning of our podcast today to explain the difference between commercial and residential. Well, with one exception, I don't invest in commercial property. Everything is residential. Now, you can make good money in commercial, but there's a very interesting reason why I choose not to. The reason is that I think as an investor, you want a strategy that will work effectively, not just in boom times, but also during recessionary times. Well, if you are, if you run a business and your business isn't going well, you got an office in a strip mall, well, okay, Maybe you make a decision to close the office to, sh to, to reduce your expenses and you operate out of your home. So the, in the investor who owned that commercial real estate now has to go and find a new tenant. Uh, the, but for residential real estate, Daniel, nobody can eliminate the need for a primary residence. Good times or bad times, you have to have a roof over your head. Now, someone may find that that they lived in a in a nice swanky five hundred thousand dollar home in a swim tennis golf community person loses their job they go into a recession so they move to a two hundred thousand dollar home that's not quite as nice in a different community but the point there is the family still needed a primary residence they went from one home to another they could not eliminate that need so as an investor, I believe it's a great way to invest because no matter what happens, good times or bad times, there will always be a market for those homes because it is an, is an unavoidable need, the need for a primary residence. And even in recessionary times, there tends to be a movement from home ownership to renting because many people are not able to stay in their homes, so they need to shift to Renton, which again helps rent uh, investors who are buying property for rental purposes. So I believe it's a very safe way to invest as long as you have a plan, you have a business plan. So like what I do uh, as a result of writing this book is I go teach around the country 
and students who come to my seminars, many of them like, I like this guy's plan. He can make me money. Then they'll, they'll, they, they won't just get the book, but they'll get a kit and they'll use that kit as their business plan. And then they'll go out and try to replicate what I've done in their own community. And that is just smart investing. I mean, I would say to anybody, whatever field of business you're in, you don't want to wing it. Get with somebody who's done it before uh, and put together a business plan, uh, whether you want to uh, run an insurance company, whether you want to start a real estate investing company, whether you want to be a great podcaster like Daniel Lu Lucas, you go and you find somebody who's done it and you invest in education and then you go and do it yourself. Great insight, Mr. Andy. And thank you for sharing your thoughts and make people empower them. And according to Mr. April, great read. What are the elements that you put in this? Your academic book, buy low, rent smart, sell high, that make this great read. Well, um, we benefited in that. We wrote this book after <clears throat> investing and, and kind of fine tuning our strategy for 12 years. So in other words, we didn't write this book two or three years after starting everybody. So we had a lot of experience, a lot of examples with case studies we could use because we were, uh, we were already experienced investors. My real estate partner, he'd, admit, he'd been investing for uh, uh, about 20 years. And I would at that point was around 13 years when we sat down and wrote the book. And the other thing is, and this is the same story with my divorce book, both my real estate partner and I were kind of perfectionist, Daniel. So we wrote the book, we rewrote the book, we rewrote and rewrote and rewrote the book. And uh, the finished product was something that we were really, really proud of. It was very, very comprehensive, very detail oriented. Um, and again, while the book itself is not a business model, it's a very easy read and somebody could pick it up and say, okay, this is something that I think I could do and I want to do it. And I understand how these guys built a portfolio or properties um, and they can easily make a decision. Is it something they want to replicate in their community or not? Yes, indeed. So Mr. Andy, what are some common real estate investment strategies? Well, so our strategy involves buying what we call post foreclosures or real estate owned property. So um, after the a foreclosure sale, when a bank takes back a property because a homeowner could not keep up with uh, the payment, there's typically a three to five months period when the property before the property is listed on MLS. That's the multiple listing service in the United States. We teach investors how to approach these banks and buy in that period before it's listed for the general public. Then once it's purchased, we teach investors how to market the property for sale or lease purchase. It's like a rent to own. So this helps the investor get a tenant in there really fast if they can't flip the property for a quick gain and they get a premium rent because the tenant wants to own the property one day and many buy it down the road that in 60 seconds is what we teach but there's a host of other strategies there's wholesaling wholesaling is a great strategy for investors who are starting off with literally no capital um, and that's really involves finding properties daniel and assigning the property to an investor with deeper pockets and taking a commission all right, there is short sales, that is uh, buying the property from the bank, but before the foreclosure sale. There's another strategy, buying on the courthouse steps. All right, that's pretty difficult because most states in the United States require cash on the spot or cash within 24 hours. Um, there's also another strategy, sending uh, letters to homeowners who are about to lose their homes and trying to buy the home before the foreclosure sale. All of these other strategies, they have, they have elements to it that we found to be very difficult. Um, and so 
we tried a lot of different things before we landed on our strategy. One example that might be different to, to, to kind of explain that. So a lot of money can be made buying property from the homeowner directly before the foreclosure sale. And that was actually our plan when we set out to invest 34 years ago. But we abandoned that because we found it too difficult. Now, what the books and seminars didn't tell us, but reality did, is that with that strategy, you actually have to visit 20 or 30 families per month who are about to lose their homes, Daniel. Their lives are falling apart. And you're trying to buy their home. Now, technically, you're helping them out because if you're successful, you're going to be able to save their credit, which will be destroyed if they lose the home. But what the seminars and, and the uh, d didn't explain when we sought to do that is that it's really emotionally taxing. And I found I didn't have the emotional makeup, the wiring to visit 20 or 30 of these families every month to buy one or two homes. I visited a couple and I called my real estate partner. And I said, I can't do this. I, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm a tough guy. And then I walked out of one of these homes and I started crying because these family, this family was so nice and their life was just blowing up. And I could not possibly, I just was not able to focus on buying their property when they were basically this lovely family in quicksand. So I, this allows me to make a really great point for you and your audience is that you want to choose an investment strategy that is a good match for you, your, the time you have and how you're wired. And there are some investment stra strategies in real estate where the investor has to work with a homeowner who's about to lose their home. And I found that is definitely something that I couldn't do. And um, uh, it's not for me. And it might be for some people, but it's not for me. So you got to choose an investment strategy, everybody, that is a good fit for you, is a good match for how much capital you have or don't have. And also another big issue is time. Some investment strategies require a lot more time. And if you're trying to squeeze this in with being a stay-at-home dad or stay-at-home mom or squeeze it in with your job, okay, then you better find a strategy you can do three or four hours a week instead of 20 or 30 hours a week. So finding a strategy that's a good fit for you, the individual, is also one of the, um, the best advice I can give you and your audience today. And it's an area in my, when I do these seminars where I see a lot of people make mistakes. How can environmental factors impact real estate values? You mean it's in climate change or, or is, that, is that what you're referring in general yeah well um this is a phenomenon that's affecting the entire world right now and uh we are seeing this and i'm 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 an individual i've got myself two electric cars we got solar power on my roof and i am very frightened by the the the, the dramatic change we're seeing in the climate all over the world the answer to your question is it's affecting real estate in a very uneven way. What do I mean by that? There are communities which are clearly uh, in a, either right now or in the future are far more of exposed to changes in the climate. A great example would be communities that are on, on the water. Why? Sea levels rising. The uh, the number of storms and the intensity of the storms are increasing. So this is something that an investor who is considering buying a vacation property on the water or invest in primarily in a beach community, you really need to be thinking about that. Do I want to have all of my investments that are in this area where, God forbid, if there's one storm, Boom, I'm wiped out. The other part that is not getting a lot of uh, 
people don't really think about a lot, which I'm, I'm dealing with this with one of my properties right now, is the insurance industry that we real estate investors depend on to insure our properties is vital. And I've been investing for now 34 years, Daniel. The changes in the insurance industry the last two or three years is absolutely massive. The costs to insure properties are going up. The payouts when there's damages is getting more challenging. Why? Because insurance companies are, are having more payouts due to climate change. Just this last six months, I had two properties, two, that had where I have insurance claims because trees fell on the homes due to violent storms. Now, in my previous 32 years, that happened once. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. So as an investor, you don't have to just be thinking about the, the, the what does, does it make sense for, for me to buy all these properties in a beachside community or this area or that area, you also have to ch check into, can I get insurance? And how much would the insurance cost? Because that is one of the, your cost factors. And 30 years ago, this was a minor consideration. Today, because of the environmental issues, like your question opened up, this is a much more significant consideration and one that many investors simply do not think about. Great question. Thank you, Mr. And these are buy low, rent smart, sell high. What do you think the best high like? Oh, my goodness. Um, I think the best thing about our model and well, I, I, I know what it is. Uh, there's well, there's two things. Our strategy is one where we, we make where it's. We make we teach investors how to make money, a lot of money, and there's very, very low risk. What do I mean by that? So a lot of strategies, they depend on an outcome for an investor to make money. But I believe and we teach that you can't do that because you don't know what the outcome is. So, for example, there are investors out there who are buy and flip investors. They make their money and only make their money if they can flip a property that they bought below market. But what happens if a buyer does not come in the door? Well, you got to keep lowering the price. And eventually, sometimes you don't even make any money. So we make money whether we flip or we don't flip. So it's a very lucrative and conservative model. But the other thing, and I know this because this came out in the Fortune Magazine interview, they were very impressed that there were six different profit sources to our model. And the typical investment strategy has two or three. So they said, this, this is really great because we don't typically see this. There's lots of different ways the investor makes money with this model and you, it's very low risk. So um, I think that's one thing I would say really stands out about our model. And I would say this, to anybody interested in becoming a real estate investor, kind of like what we've been talking about earlier during this podcast, Daniel, be very, very selective about the strategy. Make sure it's a good fit for you. Make sure there's enough money for you to make if you do it right. And I, I also think it's important that um, you make sure that the profit you make is not tied to an outcome that might not happen. So, Again, like I was saying, with our model, you buy it below market and we put it on the market for sale or lease option. Sometimes we flip it, but we don't have to flip it. If an immediate buyer doesn't come in the door, we roll it into a lease option and we typically have a tenant in the property in two or three weeks. So we don't depend on an outcome to make money. And that's one of the things that Fortune Magazine found to be uh, very sensible and very attractive to our about our model. Yes, great read in terms of real estate investing people. So before we go on, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Love Letters, people. Love Letters are a collection of love stories of people get lost, get crazy and disoriented in the name of love. 
We will learn from the stories and let be in their shoes to feel what it's like to be in love. And please do listen. Love Letters plus my books are out. Love Letters Volume 2 Love Stories. Available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. Sir Andy, can you please invite our listeners to support Buy Low, Rent Smart, Sell High or all your books? Sure. Thank you, Daniel. So... For my real estate books, go. Uh, you can get them on Amazon, and the company where I teach is Regular Riches. Our website is www.regularriches.com. But the book, Buy Low, Rent Smart, Sell High, is available on Amazon. We'd love to have you check out the book or the website. My divorce book, Take the High Road, Divorce with Compassion for Yourself, and your family is also available on Amazon. Yes, people, I support Mr. Andy Yeller because you support him. More and more books to come. Thank you so much for your time. My, my pleasure. Take you. Take care, Daniel. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, people. See you soon.